So good evening, everybody. My name is Alexei, if anybody, somebody doesn't know. Uh, I'm the president of Quantum Information Society. And before we start the actual talk, let me uh, make a formal announcement. So this is our penultimate event. And on the next week, we'll have our last event on Friday. We'll have an uh, introduction, uh, introduction to topological quantum computing by Professor Alicia from Caltech. So if you're interested, feel free to join. I have posted a link to our uh, page where you can find it. Uh, yeah, everybody are welcome. is welcome. And so today we're extremely pleased to have a talk by Professor Lukin. I generally doubt there is any need to introduce him, but anyway, like, let me do this. So he has obtained his PhD from the University of uh, Texas at Austin. And from what I could find on Wikipedia, it seems like he almost instantly joined the Howard University. He's still a professor at the University of Harvard, and he conducts research on uh, quantum manipulation of atomic systems and uh, nanoscale solid state systems uh, with the like focusing on the applications to quantum information processing, quantum computing and quantum metrology. To give you a flavor of like how his research is perceived, you might have heard over the last 20 years that physicists have stopped the light, physicists have created added photonic molecules, physicists have created a time crystal and all of this research was in the group of Professor Lukin. And the last kind of loud announcement and which made uh, gained a lot of attention was his uh, simulator of Friedberg atoms with 53 Friedberg atoms, which is two uh, atoms more than Google have with a superconducting processor. And now it feels that we'll like evidence the uh, witness the as kind of next chapter of these Friedberg simulators. So I think I should stop here and Professor Lukin, the floor is yours. So I'm... Um... Thank you very much. So one only thing that you forgot is to allow me to share my screen. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, I think now we are all good. All right. So. So thank you guys for having me here. So I was not exactly sure about the kind of the level um, of your kind of knowledge whether you are all students, undergraduate and graduate. So I kind of prepared a little bit uh, 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 that it's it's a bit colloquium style talk. So there is some, you know, kind of some introductory stuff. But so I would say, you know, please, please feel free to ask questions at any point. And I will also try to basically stop in the middle and maybe, you know, there will be some time to, to ask questions. So what I will uh, be talking about today is uh, our effort uh, to what I view as kind of, you know, controlling, you know, quest for controlling quantum world. And so when with this effort, what we're trying to do is we're trying to isolate and control some simple quantum objects and then build more and more complex systems from them. I have no doubt that many of you are involved in this effort. Um, and, you know, what kind of uh, we would like to do with this effort, we would like to really start exploring new physics with these engineered many body systems, like, for example, create and probe new quantum states of matter. But also we would like to, of course, start exploring these uh, applications, for example, quantum information processing, quantum communication, and quantum metrology. And uh, Despite of the fact that this is now, you know, quite an exciting field and you basically hear almost every day about some kind of, you know, big news and so on. This field is still, I would say, in the very beginning, because, you know, in truth, we really do not know right now how to build large scale quantum systems. So if someone tells you that I know how to build a, you know, big scalable quantum computer, that means that this person that I does not he or she does not know what, you know, they are talking about, you know, or they're, you know, just lying, you know, so, but actually the situation is even more there if you, if you, if uh, uh, you may say that and that like if I was at this point just able to kind of build a quantum computer and I would give it to you. You know, most of you, you know, actually, basically, and they're not just specifically you, but to anyone, you know, people would really not know what to do with that. So, I mean, it's true that there are some examples of algorithms like Shor's algorithm, but there are very few. And I think, you know, in particular, this motivates a big kind of question, a big kind of search to really, you know, look for what I would call useful quantum advantage. So, um, 
given that you would say well you know what are we kind of you know you know why is it so such an exciting time now and i will actually hopefully show you why so basically we are at the cusp of the kind of transition where we build machines which are big enough quantum enough coherent enough such that we can really start kind of using them to you know figure out how to build yet bigger machines and also to try to really at least kind of start you know asking this question about this useful quantum advantage so the kind of uh thing that is happening in this field i like to kind of call it the ultimate quantum rivalry and you could think about it in different different points of view you could think it's a competition between different platforms or perhaps between different nations but actually it's in in fact much more kind of a deeper you know race so it's a race between two contradictory forces of nature one is a kind of force of controllability and another one is a scalability and this is a contradict this contradiction is actually present in many areas of uh, um, kind of nature in many areas of human activity for example if you you know take a bunch of oxford educated you know physics students and put them in one organization it's probably will be a group which will be very hard to control you know so and it's like this also in quantum mechanics so um so basically you know this you know um kind of bridging this kind of these two challenges you know contradictory challenges is the current effort in the field and basically with this kind of idea it, you know in mind what uh, the current frontier of the field is to really kind of you know perform the tasks which you know modern classical systems cannot do so for example in the case of quantum computing that you know involves system operating with system of about 100 qubits or so and then basically try to use them to really explore some useful algorithms and applications so kind of that was motivated i actually am hoping today to talk about two projects in my group so one is this Rydberg atom array project which uh, was mentioned already so i'll tell you a little bit how we actually you know go about building you know potentially a scalable quantum system and uh, this will involve trapping atoms in the individual uh, uh, light beams so-called optical tweezers and i will tell you about how we try to kind of uh you know increase the size of the system increase the control and you know i'll also talk a little bit about the first um, applications i will then uh if i have time you know switch gears and tell you about another project you know where we are trying to basically you know build a backbone for future quantum networks quantum internet if you wish and this will make use of the color centers um, uh, in diamond as as a qubit carrier Okay, so on to the first topic. So why, you know, what would one would think about using cold uh, neutral atom as uh, processors? So, you know, there are many reasons why this is actually potentially a promising avenue. For once, uh, those atoms uh, have excellent coherence properties. So for example, if you now think about, you know, the leading um, uh, uh, atomic clocks they actually make use now of uh, neutral atoms. Then in addition, it's actually relatively easy to create uh, a large a system with large number of neutral atoms. You know, so in fact, around us, there are a lot of, you know, atoms and molecules right now moving. Uh, so, but, you know, of course, there are also challenges. And, you know, one is that the atom and the gas phase, phase interact generally very weakly. And then also, you know, neutral atoms are very hard to control individually, in particular in large numbers. So motivated by this consideration, a couple of years ago, uh, we started to explore, you know, basically a new approach for building quantum systems, you know, atom by atom. And the idea uh, is essentially the following. So we start with the gas of atoms uh, with a very, very low pressure, and th those atoms are basically laser cooled, you know, by using techniques which have been developed in our community in the last 30 or so years so basically by shining the light on atoms we slow the atomic motion and then what we do is we shine the focused laser beams into this uh, vacuum chamber and you know we focus them very very tightly you know such that each of these laser beam attracts the atoms to the point of this highest laser intensity and because of tight focus such then um uh, uh 
uh, optical tweezer, as we call these uh, uh, systems, you know, can trap at most one atom. So uh, basically, you know, what happens is because of tight focus, if you have two atoms, you know, they just do not fit into this, you know, uh, optical trap. So in practice, what we do is we don't start with just one tweezer. We start with hundreds, now thousands of these tweezers and try to load them all simultaneously. But this system has some entropy, right? So we cannot basically, you know, we cannot order, we cannot load all of these tweezers perfectly. So in practice, you know, we end up with a system where some optical traps are filled and some are empty. To get rid of the entropy, what we do is we simply take a picture of these atoms, figure out which traps are full and which are empty, and then basically you know, remove the empty traps and then rearrange the full traps in any way uh, we want. With that, we end up with the system of basically you know, uh, atoms which are in a well def uh, in a, in a well-determined position, in a well-determined, well-defined internal state. And they're typically spaced by a few micrometers. So at this point, those atoms just don't talk to each other. The interactions between them is negligible. To engineer interaction, what we do is we excite these atoms into the so-called Rydberg states. It's a state with large principal quantum numbers where the size of the atom literally increases by 100 to 1,000 fold. So atoms in these Rydberg states start talking to each other, start interacting, and that's how we will, for example, execute quantum logic operations and, and do things like this. And so this is actually a collaborative project of three groups. My group, um, a group of Markus Greiner, um, and a group of Vlad Vulitic at MIT. So this is kind of like a, a simple picture, you know, showing the first generation of our uh, experiment. I will then move on to talk about the second generation. So basically the key kind of element here is this device called acoustic deflector. So it's the same type of device that you might have, you know, remember, you know, people in the kind of supermarkets use as a, as a kind of the bare code scanner. So basically this device, what it does, it kind of takes as an input one laser beam and several radio frequency tones of, of the um, uh, kind of RF uh, uh, radiation. And so basically what happens in this device for each tone of RF, it kind of uh, deflects the incoming beam by a certain angle. And so basically for a given number of tones, we end up with the given set of these beams, which we now then project with the telescope into the uh, vacuum chamber. Then we have a second objective to take picture of these atoms and to activate this feedback system. And basically if we want, for example, to remove one tone, what we do, we just remove one so if we want to remove one trap, we just remove one tone. You know, if we want to shift the, um, the trap, we just chirp a frequency, change a frequency of the given tone. And that's actually the first generation of students and postdocs who build the system. Some of them uh, still are in, in my lab, but you know, many of them have gone on now to start their own group around the world. So just to talk a little bit more about this mechanism for interaction, for engineering interaction between the atoms, we like to use um, Rydberg atoms uh, with large principal quantum number for two reasons. You know, on one hand, those atoms have very long lifetime, and on the other hand, they have very strong interaction. In fact, you know, the, if you take, for example, you know, two atoms with principal quantum number hundred the interaction between them is 14 orders of magnitude. The Van der Waal interaction between them is 14 orders of magnitude stronger than the interaction between ground state atoms. So this 14 orders of magnitude is a large number and we can make a very good use of that. So in particular, if you start with these two atoms, which are very far away and you just drive them resonantly, then they will undergo um, independent radio oscillations. However, if you start bringing them, you know, a closer and closer, at some point this interaction will take over and simply what will happen is that, you know, the double excited state will be shifted way off resonance. So under these conditions, you will be able to excite one atom or another, but never both. So that's the uh, phenomenon, which is called uh, Rydberg blockade. So it basically means that simultaneous excitations of two um, atoms is blocked, you know, uh, you know, uh, for the separation smaller than this blockade radius and actually it allows us 
to uh, to basically uh, entangle atoms in a very robust way, um, you know, in a way which is insensitive to motion, to position of the atoms, and 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 et cetera, et cetera. So uh, kind of with that, you know, in mind, what we will be doing is we will basically start with the um, uh, kind of a random array, and then rearrange the atoms in the desired configuration and subject these uh, uh, atoms uh, to a sequence of pulses. It could be a well pulse exciting atoms in the Rydberg state or changing in journal state, for example, hyper state, and then just, you know, take a picture of atoms. So this will be what we will be, what I will be showing you the results of this experiment. So the first kind of, you know, thing that, you know, we could do with that is, of course, to use this, you know, system as a kind of programmable quant quantum simulator. This is, as probably most of you know, was originally the motivation for the Feynman to actually consider quantum uh, uh, computers. And actually for us, you know, this is, this is kind of very easy to sort of implement this vision. We can just arrange the atoms, engineer interactions with them, you know, perform the evolution and read out the resulting state. So from the point of view of quantum simulator, so what this system really implements is an effective spin model. So this with the Hamiltonian shown here. So basically uh, kind of in this uh, Hamiltonian, there are several parts. So this is, you know, uh, a term which is proportional to a Rabi frequency of, of lasers which excite the atoms. So this is a detuning term, which is basically, you know, where, you know which looks like chemical potential. And this is the interaction term. So if there are no interaction term, and you know, we for example ask what's the ground state of this, then this then this ground state is only determined by detuning. So if detuning is negative, it favors basically zero excited atoms, zero atoms in the Rydberg state. So you know, all atoms should be in the ground state. Detuning is positive. You know, all atoms should be in the, in the excited state. But state like this is very clearly you know inconsistent with blockade. So, for example, if blockade you know, just covers nearest neighbor, then it's clear that you will not be able to create a state like this. Instead, the state with largest number of excited atoms you know, will be the state shown here, up, down, up, down, up, down. So if you basically you know, increase the in, uh, range of interaction, uh, then you, know, you will not be, you will, block, will be blocking not only nearest neighbor, but second nearest neighbor, and then you will create a state which has broken the free symmetry and, and et cetera. So basically at this point, what we can do is we can just explore the phase this phase diagram uh, in a very simple way. We can just start with atoms all in a ground state, adjust this blockade range, and then just try to enter the, into this kind of um, uh, ordered phases. And in fact, you know, this is what's happening here. Uh, so basically, you know, um, we have several kind of examples where basically in this case, we just change positions of atoms, bring them closer together. So when they are far away, we will create this magnetic state up, down, up, down, up, down. If the atoms are a bit closer, then, you know, you have this state with broken Z3 symmetry. And then, you know, this is a state with broken Z4 symmetry. So what you see here is literally just in a kind of, in a, Kind of in one experiment, essentially in a few minutes, you know, you can just rearrange, you can program the interactions and positions, and that way, kind of explore this, you know, actually fairly sophisticated uh, uh, phase diagram. But the beauty, of course, is that we can also scale, and so this was this fifty-one atom work, which was already mentioned. So where we had one-dimensional systems, you know, with exceeding, you know, you know, fifty atoms. And um, uh, what we try to do is we try to explore these phase transitions by, for example, doing these adiabatic sweeps. And actually, in this case, you don't always get a perfect, perfectly ordered state. So that's more typical. You get these uh, states with like a, a ordered chains. And then there is this defect. There is this kind of domain wall. And so you can, for example, look at domain wall density, at the variance of this domain wall, and to kind of really uh, you know, quantify, you know, the, you know, characterize the phase transition. And so basically what you see here is that the mean number of domain walls is actually very smoothly, but variance here peaks. And this variance peaks at the point where a system is kind of frustrated. It does not know in which state, which state to choose. So this is a point exactly the, of, of the phase transition. And, you know, that way we can actually, for example, extract where the phase transition occurs. But even 
more kind of strikingly, what we can also do, we can now analyze the system from the point of view of kind of microscopic states. So actually, in some cases, we do observe the, the completely ordered system. And then actually this probability, in fact, it turns out that the most probable states from all that is created. So uh, early on, this probability was actually quite small, but you know, with the improvements we made over the last three years, for example, for system of this type, we can now you know, create this, you know, this ordered state with like a you know, high probability close to the 50%. Uh, so we can analyze this mic the states microscopically. We can also, for example, look at the density density correlator. So basically, you know, having uh, atom in the Rydberg state and the ground state is like up down up down up down correlation. And from here, we can extract things like a correlation length. So what you can see, well, like we have a lot of tools for this kind of programmable quantum simulators where we really can study phase transition. You know, things like you know dynamics and and so on. And so basically, you know, over the last few years, we actually enjoyed all of these tools. So we have, for example, used this system to implement high fidelity entanglement and parallel multi-qubit quantum gate operations. So we studied, we explored this, these transitions into all of these kind of exotic states. Uh, so we actually, you know, uh, 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 did quite a bit uh, on exploring nonlinear dynamics where you basically kick the system and see how it evolves. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in maybe a little bit in a few minutes. And we also engineered large scale entanglement. So in fact, in one of the experiments last year, we engineered, we created a 20 qubit um, GG state. So at the time, uh, at the time, this was the largest GG state. I think just very recently there are, you know, two papers, one or two papers actually slightly exceeding this number 20. So it's basically, you know, all of these directions are, you know, closely connected. So in fact, all of them involve coherent high fidelity analog and digital uh, uh, evolution. So fast forward to uh, uh, about a year ago, 2020, we actually implemented uh, the generation two of Twizar, right? Uh, so, uh, and in uh, this new generation of experiment is powered by this device called special light modulator. So this is basically a computer generated hologram. And this uh, hologram can take the incoming beam and basically create a two dimensional arrangement of, 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 of tweezers, which we, if we, uh, uh, tweezers, uh, tweezer traps, which when we, you know, project in a vacuum chamber, we can see the picture of that. So we can basically, you know, see like picture of thousands of of, of traps. So the disadvantage of this special light modulator is that it's relatively slow. So what we need to do, we need to have a second kind of channel, move the atoms to fix these imperfections. And we do it using this uh, now two acoustic optic modulators, which actually um, uh, arranged 90 degrees relative to each other. So basically what it means, we, we, we can kind of move rows and columns of atoms to basically kind of rearrange them in a desired configuration. And uh, this is, you know, what we do now in a kind of com com computer controlled way. And actually there is one other things which happened about a year ago, as you guys of course know, that's a COVID. And so we are now, you know, getting very close to this kind of um, very special day in the lab. So this was the last day where basically all of kind of the people who involved in this experiment, you know, were in the lab together. And, you know, since then, it's, you know, the lab operated with kind of minimal uh, in-person occupation at kind of at most one or two people at the same time. In fact, all of the data from which you, in what, what I'll show from now on have been taken remotely. So this basically this experiment now has been for a year operating as a server. So let me see if this works. So this, I have some movies, you know, we start with about 600 traps and then try to sort the atoms. So it doesn't always work in Zoom very well. Well, it's maybe not too bad. You know? so, so basically what you see now, again, it's a single shot of, you know, initially loaded atoms and then, you know, atoms uh, uh, created, you know, through this kind of rearrangement. So basically each, trap now is occupied with the probability which uh, exceeds uh, 99 percent and uh, so what it means is that basically we can you know create arrays up to about 300 uh, 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 atoms 
with very low uh, defects. But what's actually even more special is that now, of course, we can create all sorts of interesting kind of geometries, you know, in two dimensions. In fact, you know, we can, for example, start with arbitrary pattern and, you know, kind of randomly generated, for example, here with certain feeling and then just, you know, program it and basically, you know, let the system, you know, prepare the atomic arrangements. So what can we do with this? Uh, so the first thing is, of course, go back to this idea of quantum simulations and basically try to see if we can explore some new interesting phases of matter in two-dimensional arrays. And the simplest um, example of that would be a square lattice of the time showed here. So basically, if you have a square lattice and nearest neighbor interaction, then the kind of the simplest ordered phase will be like a two-dimensional anti-ferromagnetic phase, which actually is called a checkerboard phase. So basically, this is a phase where every other atom uh, is excited in a Rydberg state. So that looks like a checkerboard. Uh, but of course, you know, again, you can start playing, for example, with interaction range. And, you know, it turns out that once you kind of increase the interaction range, you create immediately a zoo of all sorts of, you know, interesting different, I will maybe show you a little bit of those, so related, you know, like three or four of them and, and, and study. So basically, there is a kind of interesting phase diagram can be accessed even in this very simple case, but you know, moreover, the phase transitions into these various states, even in the simplest antiferromagnetic state has actually never been observed in two dimensions, quantum phase transition in the so-called two plus one dimensional uh, system. All right, let's see if we can do it. So we prepare the square, uh, uh, lattice arrangement of the atoms again in the ground state. We pick the Rydberg blockade correctly and then just try to kind of enter into this ordered array. And, you know, once in a while we get these pictures, you know, showing a perfect arrangement across the entire lattice. Again, this is not, you know, you don't get this picture in every shot. So you can, for example, think to how to characterize it. You know, you can characterize it using this kind of correlation function, a correlation length where you see that, for example, in this case, you know, our system, which is, has more than 200 atoms, is basically correlations extend across the entire system. And we can also look at this uh, system microscopically. Again, the two most probable states are these states with perfect interferomagnetic order. And we can even ask what's the probability to kind of hit this state. So this probability actually, it turns out, scales exponentially with number, but, you know, it scores as 0.97 to the power of n. So these kind of observations help us to uh, do, uh, for example, benchmarking of our system. So this is like, this is, you know, basically to characterize how the system performs from the beginning to, to the end. So the entire, basically, you know, evolution, you know, uh, you know, is kind of encompassed here in this one number. So all effects, spontaneous emission, non-adiabaticity, imperfect readout, everything is included here. You might ask the question, okay, so how do you actually prove that you are dealing with the quantum system? And so there is a kind of one very interesting way to do it is to try to really observe the quantum uh, phase transition. So quantum phase transition, as you know, is what typically the system, you know, typically undergoes as at zero temperature. And, you know, uh, this quantum phase transition set usually characterized by the so-called universal properties and in particular, they are characterized by this so-called critical exponent. So this quantum phase transition for the Ising kind of type model in two plus one dimensions is known to have critical exponents, uh, Z equals one so-called dynamical exponent and correlation uh, critical exponent has non-trivial value of um, 0.63. How can we measure these exponents? How can we study this quantum phase transition, we can use uh, the dynamics for that. So what we can do is we can basically try to cross this phase transition at variable speed. And then what we see quite strikingly that if we go fast across the phase transition, we build you know, short correlation length. But if we go slowly, more and more slowly, the correlation length uh, grows as shown here. And so this is a plot of correlation length. Indeed, if we go slowly, the correlation length, you know, becomes larger and larger. And so to then basically connect 
this kind of dynamics with the critical exponents, we use this idea of universality. So it turns out that, you know, for phase transitions, once you are basically in the proximity of the phase transition, so the, the properties of the system and response should be basically independent on the microscopic details of, of your Hamiltonian, for example. And so what it means is that if you rescale this, you know, um, um, parameters like correlation length, your, for example, your energy, you know, the time, you know, with this kind of certain exponents, the prediction is that all of these curves should be, should collapse into the one, one simple curve. And actually, if we do it, indeed, you know, we observe this collapse. And from this collapse, we can actually extract quantitatively these exponents, which are very much, you know, basically, you know, matching similar to the to the ones which are you know predicted you know uh, theoretically for this transition they are known so there are two things which we can learn from them so first off this is actually the first time anyone has observed in any system this kind of paradigmatic using quantum phase transition but it's also is you know kind of represents benchmark showing us that we really have a kind of a quantum many body uh, behavior in the system so uh, as I already mentioned, we have now kind of expanded the scope of this investigation. We're already starting starting to study other phases, and you know this phase is actually quite interesting. So this is checkerboard phase. Uh, there is this phase with kind of larger unit sale called striated phase, and the star phase has yet another. Uh, uh, it has another large, uh, has yet larger unit cell. So this, we can just observe these phases again, just from looking at images of the atoms following the transition. And, you know, we can also start kind of exploring and mapping, you know, phase diagrams and so on. And so basically, you know, what it really means that one can really now go and, and probe and explore these exotic phases. So this is just a sampling of the projects, which uh, we're at now exploring uh, in, in our lab. So we're studying this kind of two-dimensional phase diagrams. Uh, we um, also now start to create and explore topological phases in the lattice which are frustrate, frustrated. So basically, so that would be a good kind of talk to give after your next, you know, after Jason's, you know. So this has been a long-standing goal in the field and we are actually now able to create these kind of states which so-called spin liquids you know and, and explore them so i'm not actually going to talk about that so instead maybe i'll briefly touch on the two other topics one is this idea where we explore you know far from equilibrium dynamics uh, of the system so basically what we do is we kick the system and let it evolve and kind of to in a simple way so at this point, what the system starts doing, it start, starts tra traveling and exploring various kinds of corners of Hilbert space. And basically, this is a, these are the kind of corners where no one has ever been to. So basically, whenever you do something like that, you discover something new. And then we also kind of uh, starting to use the system to basically you know, realize and test some algorithms, quantum algorithms for optimization. So that's my, that's my, um, uh, plan to discuss in the next few minutes. So let me just kind of, you know, so like uh, start and then after I, I will talk about that, I'll make a, maybe a break, a short break for questions. So, okay, so the first, you know, uh, topic uh, here involves this um, studying non-equilibrium uh, dynamics in response to the so-called quenches. So this actually historically was a, one of the very first experiments we have done with atom array initially with one dimensional system where what we did is we prepared the anti ferromagnetic state in one dimensional state up down up down up, down and then instead of just stopping here we changed the laser detuning abruptly ab abruptly just across the phase transition the idea at the time was to look how the system thermalizes but actually what we observed is something quite striking we first observed that the system thermalized but then you know after some time we saw the revival so basically this order initially disappeared and then it reappeared and it disappeared again and it reappeared again and it kind of kept going. And initially we thought, hmm, as a small system, five atoms or 10 atoms, you know, in, case, in this case, I guess nine atoms. So if we go to larger system, you know, it should just disappear. But actually we tried to do those experiments all the way up to 51 atoms and we observed this kind of, this uh, oscillation of the order parameter. 
And she, I must say, at the time, we were quite puzzled. So when we first published it, we really did not know what is going on. And since that time, there was quite a bit of work, actually, theoretical work, um, uh, uh, you know, trying to explain these observations. And uh, I think the most, maybe the most elegant of those observ explanations are in terms of concepts, which by now is called quantum many body scars. So what is that? So it borrows the analogy from classical uh, kind of single particle, you know, um, uh, chaos, uh, where, you know, uh, one paradigmatic system is a billiard. So in billiard is a well-known chaotic system, but, you know, classically, you know, uh, for example, due to symmetry properties, you know, there will be always some trajectories, a small number of trajectories, uh, which um, are, uh, are closed. So they're not stable, but you know, still, you know, you know, these trajectories exist. And you would say, well, if you now quantize the system, if you introduce some kind of uncertainty, this unstable trajectory certainly will not have any uh, impact on the resulting quantum states. It actually was shown by one of our colleagues, Eric Heller, uh, in the chemistry department here at Harvard that it's actually not true. It turns out that under certain conditions, when basically this, um, uh, and the condition is that a Lyapunov exponent uh, multiplied by the period, the time should be smaller than one, those trajectories result kind of in the emerging, you know, quantum states, which very much eigenstates, which very much resemble those trajectories. And so these are the so-called, you know, quantum scars. And so basically what um, uh, people, you know, showed in particular that it's a group by, uh, by Maxim Serbin and Dima Abanin, they actually, you know, suggested that what we observed is a many body version of this, of this quantum scars. And one way to kind of think about that is to think about, you know, this, uh, uh, states which we observed as a kind of singular states in the background of all, all, all otherwise completely formalizing uh, continuum. Another kind of interesting way to think about it is in terms of matrix product states. So actually it turns out that you can uh, find a low bond dimension matrix product states in case you guys know what it is. It's a basically a way to describe the uh, uh, kind of dynamics of entangled system. So uh, where you basically some effective parameters of these matrix product states form this kind of unstable trajectory, you know, and basically what happens is the system evolves in this trajectory for some time before it basically, you know, vanishes into this, you know, highly entangled, you know, formalizing state. So basically this kind of ideas are now being very actively explored. There is a paper almost every week about that theoretical paper about this many body scar phenomenon. So one question we can ask is, can we explore this many body scars in two dimensional systems? And uh, this is fairly easy for us to try. So for example, we can you know, start with the system. In this case, um, uh, I think this kind of hexagonal lattice here, maybe this, this one is honeycomb lattice. So, and then basically it's a bipartite lattice. You know, we can try to prepare an anti-ferromagnetic state as shown here. And then what we do is just we do this rapid quench and that's actually what we observe is quite striking. Basically, this, you know, the order completely disappears. It becomes the system becomes kind of random. But then later on, this order reappears. You know, we wait a little bit, the order disappears and then it reappears again. And so basically, it turns out that, you know, most of the bipartite, 2D bipartite lattices support these many body scars. We can also look at the dynamics on like sub lattices, like for example, as as it's shown here. But now, of course, with all of these very different kind of geometries and so on, we can really study these scars in a great detail. And one of the kind of uh, thing which we try to do is we ask a question, can one somehow stabilize? So these scars, these oscillations, they don't last forever. They basically, the system, you know, collapses and revives for a bit and then kind of they go away. And one idea which we decided to try is that instead of quenching to the fixed detuning, we decided to quench it to the detuning which depends on time. Uh, why do we want to do it? Well, you would think naively this is not a good idea because basically once you start kind of subjecting system to periodic perturbation, you know, it will, you know, heat up, you know, nothing good can happen. But actually, 
as was mentioned already before, so a couple of years ago, we and ours worked on this, you know, uh, phenomena such as discrete time crystals, which basically, you know, under certain conditions, uh, the system which is periodically driven can actually be forced into this kind of very unusual order where it will, it will respond with the period which is multiple kind of uh, uh, um, uh, driving period. And what we're wondering whether we could use this kind of periodic driving to stabilize quantum anybody scars. So the answer, it turns out to be yes. And so this is an example. Here is one dimensional 1D chain uh, where we just quench uh, to a fixed detuning and we observe the scars. But now if we quench to the time varying detuning, what we observe indeed this kind of enhancement, dramatic actually enhancement by the, of the scar lifetime. Not only that, you know, it turns out that the frequency of the revival locks to the half frequency of the drive. And you can see it here, you know, so this is an example of this, you know, nine atom chain. You know, this is a honeycomb lattice with 41 atoms. So it's decorated, this is more kind of exotic honeycomb with 66 atoms. And you see this kind of a wide range of parameters where the frequency you know, really locks. So what is that? So there was actually another discovery, I must say, we did not quite expect that, you know. Uh, so why is this, you know, stabilization, you know, robust? Is it kind of a phase which is similar to discrete time crystals? So these are things which we are, you know, still exploring. In fact, there was a paper on archive this week, you know, which I think the answer is tentatively yes. Um, uh, but, you know, what I want to kind of really show you that, you know, this uh, kind of phenomena, this effect really allows you to steer the money body entanglement dynamics of the system. So what is shown here, and I think that's the first time some the movie like this has been created, is an experimental data, which where we track all possible microscopic states for one atom chain. And, you know, there are two things that you see. One is the uh, this driven system, of course, lives kind of a uh, longer time. But even more importantly, if you look at this kind of lower left corner, you will see um, that um, uh, the trajectory of this many body system is altered. And as a result of that, you know, basically this altered trajectory greatly suppresses thermalization. For example, if you look at entanglement, Entropy, you see that for this kind of driven system, it's much more, uh, the, the entanglement entropy grows much more slowly as, as, as opposed to the system which are, is undriven. So I think this actually is very cool because potentially it might allow us to really navigate the system in this high dimensional um, uh, Hilbert space. So just before I you know, finish my part, and actually it kind of takes a little, a little, bit, little bit longer than I expected uh, about the atom arrays, I also want to uh, uh, point out that, you know, a lot of this work which we are doing is actually related to um, uh, kind of very interesting mathematical uh, uh, problems, um, uh, which could be used uh, basically to implement uh, quantum optimization. And so one specific <coughs> problem, which is very much related to what I already was showing you, is what's called maximum independent set. So the idea here is the following. Suppose you are given a graph uh, with vertices and which are connected by the edges. And uh, the independent set is a subset of all of these vertices which are not directly connected to each other. So, so for example, these red uh, dots here constitute an independent set. And like many of these kind of you know hard problems, this problem is very easy to formulate. The MIS problem consists in finding the largest independent set. And so this uh, uh, picture, you know, which you know maybe reminds you these days where you could still travel uh, and uh, 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 kind of look at the back cover of the airline magazine, you know, so is basically an example of maximum independent set on the so-called unit disk graph. So it turns out these problems are actually, you know, known to be how very hard to solve. They are actually in P-complete, in P-hard. Uh, but if you, you know, basically if you followed my talk, you realize immediately that the kind of effective cost function for this problem is very much similar 
to this um, Rydberg blockade Hamiltonian. So basically, remember in Rydberg blockade, you would like to excite as many atoms as possible, but you cannot excite atoms within this blockade radius. And this is exactly, you know, uh, encodes this uh, maximum independent set. So this uh, field of quantum optimization, you know, has a kind of a long history. There is a, a lot of work, for example, on this quantum annealing, the wave. There is this uh, idea of quantum uh, approximate optimization. Basically, our approach is we can implement all of these algorithms now very efficiently via what's called now co-design. So the idea is the following. So we start with the graph, then we encode this graph, you know, in effectively in positions of atoms and interactions between them. So basically this one kind of link means that, you know, you have a blockade, you know, over this, you know, pair, so they cannot be excited simultaneously. And we just can implement them uh, by adjusting our interactions and then, you know, trying to create this kind of the ground state, you know, something which is close to the ground state of this, you know, uh, model and then basically, you know, just read off, you know, the resulting, you know, uh, independent set. So been now we have been now exploring this for some time and we, you know, kind of uh, exploring various types of algorithms. Some are kind of quasi-adiabatic, some are more like in this kind of QA variety. So this is an example of the uh, algorithm, which is actually sort of in between where we basically try to go through the idea adiabatically across a phase transition, but we are actually across a transition in this case, but we kind of um, adjust, we try to optimize the way how we sweep the parameters. And actually what you see now, we already have, you know, on this graph sizes, which are, you know, about 200 nodes, uh, we can actually see a fairly good performance. These are still graphs, which are small enough that you can actually solve them. But nevertheless, what we are you know, starting to do, we are starting to do like systematic benchmarking of this effort. So the basic the key goal here is to find the graphs which will be hard classically, but easier quantum mechanically. I think this is actually a lot of, uh, is a very kind of cool, very um, uh, exciting collaboration with theorists where we are looking also for things like sampling inference. And you know, this is a very nice kind of interesting interface. Okay, so this was sort of, you know, I thought will be like a three quarters of my talk, you know, I want to kind of now start discussing something else, but maybe I can stop here and take some questions. Yeah, I think we have some questions already. Uh, yeah. So would you like to answer them right now? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think the first question was like, after one of your first slides, from Alexandra Sirduk, and she asked, yeah. "Why do you use when you have uh, the explanation of your first experimental setup with one D uh, arrays?" She asked, "Why do you use De Croix glass, and don't you use don't you get different absorption coefficients?" Yes, yes, yes. Just one second. Let me let's accidentally exit my presentation. So um, I need I need to look to see where it's. Uh -huh. it's so is it was it here uh yeah i think so so this dichroic di glass so basically it, it's it, it's used to essentially filter the the trapping light right so this we use we use 800 uh, eight nanometer light to trap particles right and we kind of filter it from the light which atoms emit mm -hmm. right so that way we can independently you know, uh, basically uh, monitor the tweezers and atoms. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea. I see. So we also have a question from Shanshin, and he asks, uh, could you please comment on the pros and cons of uh, Rydberg atom simulator versus trapped ions? So this was, um, I guess, maybe the answer is a little bit uh, um, kind of clear by what I have, uh, I've shown before. So basically the current kind of status is that certainly, you know, trapped ions um, is one of the leading platform, if not the leading platform in terms of really controlling small number of, um, you know, particles, for example, like in terms of two qubit gates, I think they really help, you know, you know, world record in terms of fidelities, you know, 
Um, and you know, the kind of recently, the, those um, experiments have been extended to something like you know twenty or thirty, you know, maybe up to kind of fifty um, uh, ions. However, the problem is that you know basically that you know ions uh, they repel each other, and so when you start with the system which has too many of those particles, you know, you basically have to somehow relax the, the trap in which they are trapped. So as a result, so basically once you have, you know, a system uh, like in a linear trap of more than, you know, 40 or so ions, it becomes extremely challenging to, to control. It becomes extremely fragile. Moreover, you know, despite the intense interest and I would say several years of work, it has been very challenging for ions to extend their technique into two-dimensional systems. And so, for example, these kind of things which I showed you, you know, these experiments with, you know, 200 or 300 atoms in two dimensions, they are right now out of the reach for trap time. So I would say, you know, we are learning a lot from trap times and you know we are learning in particular you know these ideas to control better to improve fidelity but we have an advantage at least for now in a kind of medium term in terms of the ability to go to larger systems that's what's special uh, so we have a, a, another question and it's mostly about the kind of practical value of these uh, rubric simulators like yeah. how like how we can benefit from uh, studying different quantum phases of the Isaac model and their transitions and their transitions and like as far as I can get how we can benefit from quantum scar states are they useful for anything yeah okay so okay so basically from my kind of okay benefit it depends on what, so what you kind of mean exactly so basically what you already see now with these kind of systems for the example of quantum scar you know gives you an example of i would say a discovery i think it's one of the first examples of a real scientific discovery made with the quantum machine and this is will be the real kind of near term benefit of these quantum systems that we can really do things that classically is impossible to simulate exactly and we can then, you know, basically try things out and really make kind of scientific discoveries. Stabilization of the scar states with periodic drive is another discovery. This is something which is, you know, if you know the answer, you can kind of build a model to, to, to kind of simulate it in some reasonable way. But, you know, if you really want to do these things exactly for, you know, systems more than, I don't know, like 30 atoms, it's impossible, right? Now, you can ask a question, where do these things like these quantum scars, would they be useful for something? And actually, potentially, yes. So basically, the big question in quantum information science is, you know, you would like to create entangled states. You would like to control the evolution, but this entangled state should be somehow useful. So like, for example, one entangled state is a state where the closed system completely thermalized. This state has a lot of entanglement, but it's completely useless. So what we would like to do, we would like to kind of start creating these entangled states for purposes such as maybe quantum error correction or purposes such as metrology, where basically, you know, you have some entanglement, but you can really control your system and if needed, disentangle it, you know? And I think quantum scar is the first example of this type of emergent phenomena, right? So beyond that, of course, we do hope, as I already mentioned, start to start applying this platform for things like, you know, quantum optimization, maybe sampling and, and so on. Thank you. And I think uh, another question from Nikita, uh, he basically asks how your, uh, like this quantum pseudo annealing algorithm uh, compares to classical counterparts. The best yes. one. This is something that we are now carefully kind of, uh, you know, uh, studying and, you know, right now, as I said, that this kind of these uh, instances which we can implement or which we implemented so far are the instances which can be at least classically solved, you know, classically solved. And basically what we are trying now to do is basically compare our approach to both kind of general pur purpose algorithms, such as, for example, um, kind of Monte Carlo type algorithm, but also to 
uh, like more specialized like heuristic algorithms. So, so for example, readiness is one of those. And so this is a work which is uh, in progress. And, you know, as I said, our hope is that we will be able to find some graphs which are hard classically, but, you know, easier quantum mechanically. I would stop here. But uh, haven't Devay did anything like that? They have tried, but I do not think that, you know, there is any kind of conclusive result so far. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, I can tell you that the D-Wave machine, for example, failed this, you know, what I call it Kibo Zurich test, you know, for example, for extracting the exponents, they were not able to extract quantum exponents. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the exponents they extract are much closer to classical. Uh, I mean, and I think overall, it's really not clear, you know, what's, you know, if, if, you know, if in any, there is any real quantum sort of quantumness in the D wave machine. So they have some new papers just recently, a couple of weeks ago, they had a paper where they, you know, suggest that the performance scaling is better than, um, than classical, you know, than sort of, I guess, uh, kind of Monte Carlo. You know, okay, I'm not, I'm not sure yet to what extent this is true, but I do not, basically, I do not think that there is a clear example where they would really see some, 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 um, some real advantage. And they did claim it a few times, but it, there were always some, you know, algorithms discovered which um, outperform classically those, which I think is, you know, I think it's a good competition, right? So one outcome of this potentially is, you know, there will be a better classical algorithms, which I think would be perfectly fine, right? So, and, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I think we have another question just about this slide. Uh, yeah. Alexander, Alexander asks again, why not use single color glass with the optimal absorption? Sorry, for, for about this dichroid, dichroid. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's about yeah, I, Look, we want, no, no, so what we need, we, we need, we want to image traps. We need to separate this beam. We don't want to just block, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? You know, we don't want to block this beam. We want to image both of them, right? And you can use it different ways. It's just one way, you know, how mm -hmm. we do it. It's kind of maybe, um, uh, let me just see if I can, you know, so this is, for example, in this kind of two-dimensional, right? So this is a, see, this is an array of traps, right? You know, and then we also want this an array of traps, and then we also want to image the, the atoms on the top of those, right? So that's the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, let me also ask a question about the uh, these uh, quantum scars. You said yeah. that in, in classical billiards, that these kind of trajectories, which are uh, closed, yeah. They are very rare. They kind of they are very contrived. So my question is, how did it happen that, you, like, it, it feels like to get this quantum scar, you need like some very, like, specific set of parameters. That's correct. Like, yes. So how did it happen that you just like got these parameters in your experiment? Yeah. So it just turns out that this antiferromagnetic state is, you know, something which is very close. So it's a little bit of serendipity, right? Ah, I see. So. Uh, and uh, I mean, we do gain some, for example, for the case of the driven scars, it turns out that this antiferromagnetic state, they are sort of become like an effective, you know, very low energy state of this driven effective Hamiltonian in a rotating frame. But it's, this is something that absolutely not obvious from the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. So this is basically the, what the scars, you know, in this case, the scar manifold really corresponds to this select, you know, set of eigenstates, which are really separated from all this is basically a thermalizing, you know, continuum. So there is, you know, there is a, you know, it's a, you know, exponentially small number of the states which involve in what we call the scar manifold, right? And it just sort, I mean, just so happens that, that, um, that this antiferromagnetic state is very close, is basically one of them. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, and, okay. But that's that's a reason why it's so for example, there is a lot, I mean, the reason why people are still kind of interested in that and is that in the SCAR um kind of literature, we still don't know, for example, what are the conditions for 
for these scars to be present and other systematic ways to look for scars. Mm -hmm. So it's not even clear if the system has can have like non-trivial strongly interacting system has perfect scars. So in some of the papers we've shown that one has to actually modify this Hamiltonian in some non-trivial way to actually improve these scars, but you know, can you improve them to be perfect? We don't know. So it's there are a lot of questions. And the, there are there are some very nice connections to lattice gauge theories. For example, this is a I think that's this paper by the uh, Mar Mar Marcello Del Monte's group, where they they actually show that this kind of scars uh, basically correspond in the kind of lattice gauge theory to the kind of false vacuum, basically. Of, of the corresponding theory. So it is a lot of, it's a cool, it's a very cool direction. And these driven scars, we just start to understand them. So yeah. uh, regarding the driven scars, like isn't it something like a parametric, like not amplification, so like parametric drive-in? Well, it is a little has a little bit kind of, you know, uh it's a little bit has a little bit of that physics, but you know, um but you know the, the problem is that you know by that kind of logic you know if you have a many body system mm -hmm. what should happen is that the system should thermalize right? because you just have so many degrees of freedom which you kind of kick right and already the kind of the surprise that the, the presence of this discrete time crystal the surprise was that it's not always the case right so for example if you have many body localization you might have this kind of stable phase, you know, um, you know, sometimes you can have this kind of pre formal you know, behavior, basically that means that this response will, will exist for kind of up to infinite and exponentially long time, exponentially with, with system size. And so basically it, it looks like what we observe here is related, both well, not exactly the same to this um, discrete to these pre-formal discrete time crystals. And what's actually interesting is that basically you need to go to there. So maybe I'll show something. Do you see it here? Yeah, maybe. yeah. So it actually, what's kind of remarkable is that this kind of this, sub, this subharmonic stabilization is actually uh, is very robust. So, uh, and, and so, so, and in fact, it becomes robust only when the system size becomes large. So basically, you need to have a linear system size dimension on the order of ten for that response to start to be kind of robust. So in this in this paper, which in this new uh, archive paper, we kind of have shown that you can think about it as a as a certain kind of many body echo. But then again, the, the, this echo would be perfect at one point. And this robustness is really a many body phenomenon. Uh -huh. But, you know, it's still, you know, it, there is a lot of room for a kind of exploration, so. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know, sh sh do you want to proceed with the talk or maybe- Well, it's a little bit up to you guys. So I do have maybe, uh, we can still discuss a little bit. So I've been now I've been going for an hour, I think about. So I can tell you a little bit about our efforts uh, involving this quantum networking. Mm -hmm. We can discuss more this atom array or we can just finish here. What up to you? It's up to you. I think we'll be happy to listen like a little bit about the. So why don't we maybe take 10 more minutes or so and you know. Yeah, sure. So I, yeah, so I'll like we'll switch gears a little bit and you know talk about our work to build quantum networks. So, so I guess you all guys you know know that this quantum networking is a kind of also a big topic. And there was actually it was a new paper recently from Janway Group, uh, Janway Pan's group, showing that they now start combining in China this you know this um, satellite quantum key distribution with. Um, with also this kind of, you know, like local networking connecting this kind of nodes. But all of these networks, they have one big limitation. 
And you know, specifically, this limitation, you know, in this case, for instance, you know, what you need in this in, the, in in this network, you have this kind of, you know, these nodes, which are basically nodes where you take the information, quantum information, convert it into classical information, and then re-encode it and send it on. And it, of course, kind of defies a little bit the purpose of this quantum network. And the reason why they have to do it is basically because all conventional channels, they have photon loss. And basically, this photon, once you lost a photon, you know, there is not very much you can do uh, about that. And um, that makes, for example, the prospects for really building, you know, long distance kind of quantum networks, internet, quantum internet, you know, quite challenging. So this problem has actually been thought about already since quite some time. Uh, and it turns out there is a solution for that. And the solution is to basically, as nodes, use small quantum computers. So the quantum computers, which can basically store and process quantum information, and then basically link these nodes to transmit quantum states over a uh, 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 large distance. So basically, you know, that's the basis for the so something which is called quantum repeaters is nodes can in principle, you know, if you couple them to photons efficiently and they have long enough memory, they can actually kind of use to essentially correct the loss errors in this kind of photonic transmission. So as you see, these ideas have uh, by now are like 20 years or so old. And you know, there has been a lot of work to realize them, but up to now, this has been challenging. So uh, I will tell you about our approach where we now are making real progress towards that. And so basically, you know, in our approach, what we uh, do is we basically try to integrate, you know, coherent quantum emitters, single atoms or atom-like systems with this kind of devices shown here, these are sub wavelength devices, in this case is one dimensional photonic crystal, with the idea that those, you know, single atoms can basically be used as, as, as the nodes. So the challenge is, of course, one needs to basically, you know, learn how to create this strong coupling and how to kind of manipulate these atoms and, and, and set them. So this is a work which is actually in collaboration also with my colleagues, Marco Longcar, Hunkun Park, and Joe Kingwood. So the, um, uh, in these experiments, which I will show you now, we make use of atom-like impurities in diamond. So those are the kind of impurities which make the diamond kind of colorful. And for example, one you know famous impurity, the so-called nitrogen vacancy center is something which has been now used for several years for to implement small quantum registers, one quantum alg algorithms, and even for, uh, for tests uh, of the Bell states. But actually compared to what I've been talking before, those um, NV centers, they actually do not behave quite like individual atoms. So the big kind of advantage of atoms or ions is that if you create a string of them or some assembly, they are to the leading order completely identical to each other. And it's not the case for these impurities. They are, they behave like individual atoms, but because of their local environment and perturbations, you know, they are different. And so basically, you know, motivated by that, we kind of, for a few years ago, started looking for new color centers, which would have kind of special engineered properties with the idea that they really should be kind of identical. And so such that if, for example, you one of them can emit a photon, then you know the other one would be able to kind of reabsorb uh, the photon. And actually, it turns out that there is a family of color centers which are much more atom-like. Those involve basically a silicon atom, which replaces uh, two carbon atom and a diamond lattice. But actually compared to NV center, which basically then occupies the empty carbon site, you know, those, uh, the silicon atom is a little bit larger. So this defect is what's called interstitial. So it resides in between the two uh, lattice site. And actually it turns out that this change is very important. So basically it turns out that the silicon vacancy centers and centers like this, they have actually much more favorable symmetry properties. And as a result, they behave much more like single atoms as opposed to NV centers and other emitters. So then what we do is basically 
uh, we make devices of the time shown here. So it's again like a decade of you know blood and sweat. So this basically is device is literally a string which is carved carved out of diamond. So we basically use reactive ion etching to basically create this kind of string. So here, these holes is really the, the region of this nano cavity. And basically, we implant silicon ions in there. And then what we do is also this is kind of thin region. We come and touch it gently with a tapered optical pipe fiber. And as a result, we end up with the system where we, if we excite the silicon vacancy, we can actually you know, get a photon click with more than 90% probability. And this uh, system also basically it represents this cavity quantum electrodynamic system where basically, you know, one atom, you know, completely dominates, uh, for example, you know, if you put it in a cavity in resonance, completely dominates the property. So it actually has an excellent performance in terms of this cavity QED. So, uh, okay, so what can we do with the system? So one question is whether we can use it as a kind of a memory, as a node. So, and in fact, it, the answer is yes. So we can use, for example, spin state of the silicon vacancy center as a qubit. Um, uh, only one, draw, one drawback is one has to actually cool it uh, below, um, uh, below Kelvin, but you know, it's basically, this can be done now. Um, and you know, once you know you do it, you can basically manipulate this qubit. You can read it out, for example, through the cavity, because you know if you have, for example, different resonances corresponding to different states. And in fact, you can you know do a single shot readout with fidelity, which basically has four nines. You know, which is actually one of the it's across all systems is one of the highest fidelities. And so what we have done with the system, we for example. You know, studied interaction between two silicon vacancies. We have performed two qubit gates. We also used nuclear spins for long-lived memory. Uh, and so this is one example of application, which is you know, uh, um, which is called heralded photon storage. So here, what we would like to do, we would like to use this silicon vacancy center to store the incoming qubit and uh, store its state, but also know when this storage occurred, when the photon actually arrived. And the way how it works is the following. So we basically start with the system where, you know, conditioned on the spin state of the uh, silicon vacancy center, the incoming photon is either reflected or transmitted. And uh, then we do, we perform the operation of the following kind. So we first prepare a superposition, a 50-50 superposition of up and down state of silicon vacancy center. And we use this so-called time beam qubit where the, the photon is encoded either in early arrival or in late arrival. And so, and in between this photon arrival, we perform a pi pulse. So what happens then, you know, initially you have a product state of spin and photon. But then, you know, using this kind of conditional reflection, you basically kind of, you know, eliminate first one component of the state, then eliminate another component of the state. Um, and, you know, uh, as a result, you basically end up with the spin photon entangled state. So to do heralded storage, what you do simply is measure this incoming photon state in the X basis. You basically erase information about early or later arrival. And basically what you see here immediately, that's the same state written here is if you, for example, you know, detect, you know, one state in this uh, X basis, then you have, a, uh, you know, uh, you have this state in the memory. If you have another photonic state, you have this state in the memory. So basically this is essentially like a teleportation procedure. You measure a photonic qubit and this photonic qubit measurement teleports your initial photon state into the memory state. And one can now quantify this performance. It's actually very good, it turns out. So we have you know, fairly high fidelity and the heralding success probability is 50% here in its actually because of this fact that you know, half of the photons is actually kind of transmitted and then kind of lost. So, okay, what can we do with this device? And so we have now applied it to a quantum communication task. And this quantum communication task is what's called measurement device independent quantum key distribution. Normally, the way how it works is the following. So you have Alice and Bob, which are separated, which send you know, simultaneously photons 
and they are measured in the middle, you know, they are measured with this beam splitter device in the bell basis. So whenever these photons arrive and you basically measure, for example, this phi plus base state, what, what, what is central um, a node called Charlie often does, it basically, you know, signals to Alice and Bob that this psi plus measurement was carried out and actually it creates a correlation between Alice and Bob. And this correlation, it turns out, can be used, for example, to distill the key and, and so on. So that's the idea of measurement device independent QKD, which is now basically a state of the art. That's a technique which is, you know, people are, you know, using in the last few years. Uh, and the technique works very well for short distances, but actually if you start increasing the distance, you know, then what happens is then when Alice and Bob send these photons, the probability that they will arrive simultaneously because of loss becomes exponentially small. So that's this, you know, uh, loss problem. So basically what it means is that, you know, for channels, you know, larger than, you know, basically, you know, 100 or so kilometers, this is just, you know, this becomes, you know, very impractical. So how can our uh, uh, memory help? So the idea is the following. So if we can do this heralded storage, then we do not need for these two photons to arrive simultaneously. You know, whenever the photon from Oles arrives, we can store it and then we just can wait until Bob's photon arrives, you know, and then we can do this kind of joint uh, uh, bell measurement on this photon pair and actually the resulting, you know, uh, fidelity still scales exponentially, but you see that this basically effective distance here is cut in half because we don't need for both of these guys, for both of these probabilities to be simultaneous. So here is kind of to make a long story short, the result of the measurement which we carried about a year ago. So this, um, what we do here, we look at the uh, key rate in bits per channel uh, use uh, as a function of effective loss uh, in the system. So it's a proof of principle table tabletop experiment, but we can effectively, you know, uh, uh, simulate this loss, we can just introduce this loss. So this is the best possible transition, you know, result in direct transmission, which scales exponentially. So this is what we measure experimentally. Indeed, you know, it has a slope, which is, you know, one half of that. And in fact, for this loss amount, it's a several orders of magnitude larger rate. Now, of course, this, you know, system is imperfect. So we have to then, you know, once we get this result, do things like error correction and so on and privacy amplification. So this is a result of that. So and this result is still factor, factor of four or five, you know, larger than the best possible direct transmission. So this is a kind of, if you want, quantum advantage in communication. And um, uh, we actually are now quite excited about that. So we are basically trying now to, you know, scale the system up, also deploy it in a kind of, real world, you know, this is actually a Boston area network, which we are, you know, trying, you know, to study. And of course, we would like to kind of, you know, go beyond eventually, you know, and combine maybe these ideas with satellites and maybe even wire up, you know, our atom array and, you know, superconducting processor. Well, anyway, this is, I think that's maybe time for me to stop, you know, so thank you very much, guys. Oh, th th thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm, I'm... I'm not quite sure we have any questions for this part. I think everybody were. Yeah. But maybe we can wait for a bit more. Um, I, I, I just wonder like how, mm, how mm, sensitive is this like little quantum memory? Like, so you, I just like, you, you showed the map like of the United States where you like you can build a, no, a network of these nodes, but like how far like in practice we are from that. So yeah, so the light, it's basically, it's a lifetime. It's a question of lifetime and uh, it is limited. But for example, if you use nuclear spins as a kind of auxiliary memory, then it's actually, it lasts, you know, we have demonstrated the memory, which is at least as long as a second. And the second is a kind of, is important benchmark because Basically, if you want to do, and it's kind of related to the fact that if you want to do communication, for example, across, you know, a couple of thousand kilometers, you need this memory because this quantum repeater protocol, if you want, it involves kind of two-way quantum error correction. So you need this kind of, you know, 
for example, few thousand kilometer node to exchange the information before your memory decoheres. Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, if you know, kind of if you just use a speed of light and this kind of few thousand kilometer kind of distances, what you realize is, you know, basically, you know, the time that you need to store is kind of a fraction of the second. So basically, once you have a second long lifetime, you know, and you system works reasonably efficient, you are kind of in business. Mm -hmm. and, and how efficient is, the, is this system? What's the fidelity? I don't know. What is the metric for? So, yeah, so you know, there are two kind of, okay. So what, you know, for this system, for these things to work, right? You don't need many qubits in this intermediate nodes. In fact, you can just use two, you know, it turns out, you know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but those nodes should work very, very well. And they should work well in two respects. One of them is fidelity. And another one is basically efficiency. And so, for example, like, you know, fidelity could be in this, you know, in this heralded storage. You know, how, if the photon arrives, what's the fidelity of the mapping? And so what? I've shown you is that we can map these photons with fidelity of 95%. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is, uh, okay, I mean, this is not perfect, but it's a very good start. You know, I think in practice, we should be probably close to like 98, 99 to really scale up. But, you know, there is the room to scale up. And the second one is, is basically what's called probability. So if the photon, if you send the photon, What's the probability you actually store it? And for example, in this kind of heralded protocols, this probability should include everything. Should include, you know, the probability that the photon from a fiber goes into your system, and then you know you have a heralding detector. So all of that should be. And so basically, uh, in our, you know, kind of in our. Uh, in the systems which we realize now. So if we can, if we excite this emitter, right, we can extract a photon with more than 90% 90, 90 probability. We can get a photon click actually, not just extract, but entire system. So, and that's what you need. You need the systems to kind of, you know, perform at this kind of 90 plus you know, efficiency level. So the probability of um, of this um, storage, uh, of this heralded storage was actually in the things which we demonstrated was closer to 50%. And this is because our cavities were not were kind of suboptimal. So ideally we need to have over coupled cavities so that the photons always kind of reflected. So in our case, the photon was kind of transmitted. So, uh, Oh well, wow. so there is another question, I guess. Yeah, I think I think it should be the last one, and then we'll uh, let you free if you don't mind. So, so we're able to repeat. Mm, well, okay. So what we compared in this plot, which you still see now, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, so the, the, the loss, in our case, we basically just modeled the loss by just introducing a lossy element. So this is a tabletop, it's not a field experiment. But so the, the, the red curve is assuming that you have a perfect system except for this loss. Right, so everything is perfect. Detectors is perfect, everything. So the, the red, the, the green points is our actual experimental results, which now include all our imperfections. So the fact that we can only, for example, that our heralded memory works with 50%, you know, it's included here, right? So, and moreover, these infidelities and everything is also included here. And then, you know, what we do, of course, the resulting key is basically not perfect. And that's what we do. We do this kind of, you know, 
error correction, you know, privacy amplification and whatnot, just using conventional techniques. And then, you know, basically this is, you know, I think this is a kind of a first experiment in this quantum repeater, quantum networking area, which is really kind of a system level experiment, right? So this, this you know, uh, black dot, it kind of includes now everything, all imperfections, everything, error correction and so on. And basically after that, we still outperform this, you know, ideal channel for the given loss. So that's the idea. Right? And that's what you need to do at the end, right? You at the end, you if you deploy it in the field, you want to see that you know all of these efforts and reducing memory pay off. You know, that's what you have to do. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, oh, all right then. Then thank you very much, Professor. Looking for joining us for agreeing to give this uh, amazing talk. Like we have learned so so much today, I think, all of us. And okay. uh, right, it was great. You know, was and great I, th I think we got. We, I think I think we got a charge of like to do some quantum computing, quantum information processing science even more harder than we do right now. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah, so thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Okay. Very, very all right. Okay. Thank you, guys. See you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you.